Have you ever argued with somebody over something? Recently, I was at a Starbucks working on my sermon, and I noticed a homeless man come in, and he walked up right to the counter, and I thought, well, maybe he's going to order a coffee or something. But no, he sticks his hand right into the tip jar and tries to take it. At that moment, everybody got gathered around. All the employees said, hands off, buddy, that's mine. And he just thought it was take a penny, leave a penny. I don't know, but he thought he was entitled to it. They argued for a few minutes and then he left. Thankfully, the tips were okay. Maybe you've seen siblings fight over, no, that's my comb or that's my controller, that's my bike. You see people digging in their heels trying to win an argument. Or you could think of a time when you and your spouse possibly were arguing or we'll say discussing something like where to go to dinner and how passionate you were about trying to get your way. Now, the examples that I just gave, they have to do with material things, they have to do with the body, but when it comes to religious arguments, wars have been started, battled, and fought over their beliefs. People have spent so much energy and time digging in and protecting their own belief systems. And rightfully so, we want to stand for truth and the word of God, and we want to elevate that in our lives. We want to hold it dear. We want it to lead us and direct us and inform us in the political sphere and all that we do. But we're going to see here in Acts chapter 11 how someone can be so religiously convicted that it leads to great difficulty understanding how someone could be converted. Now, we're living in a day and age where moving from Judaism to Christianity, for a Christian, we've got thousands of years of of history now, church history, uh, of miracles being performed, prophecies being fulfilled, the Word of God spreading. So we have a rich tradition to stand upon to see how a person could go from believing in the future Messiah to now the fulfilled Messiah. We can see it a little more clearly today, but back then it was as difficult as maybe a Hindu and a Muslim fighting. It was as difficult today as an atheist and a Christian fighting. It was as difficult then for those people as it is today for us from seeing people from just polar opposite spectrums of religious belief and and seeing one changed, changed, changing of the heart and changing of the mind. And in Acts chapter 11, God is going to use Peter to go and share this message with people who have dug in their religious hills. And so they are obstinate towards any kind of change or transformation to be taking place in their lives. But God's going to use Peter to defend the gospel for the Gentiles. He's going to use Peter to defend the gospel being made known for all people, not just the chosen ones, the holy race of Israel that God had chosen to be his people in the Old Testament, that the Good news is going to be for all mankind. So even even the Christians that were former Jews that were still dug into their Jewish religious beliefs had to have their eyes opened up, we'll say. Their eyes opened up to be able to see what Peter was seeing from the Lord. And in doing so, we're going to see this explosion, an explosion of the church, rapid multiplication, when there's a shifting away from an us versus them to I've got good news for all, oh, God moves greatly. So let's look together in Acts chapter 11 and verses 1 through 14. And we're going to kind of summarize what happens in Acts chapter 10. Paul did a great job talking last week, and we're so thankful that Pastor Paul of Revive Church, our future granddaughter, church, that already gathering a launch team and meeting regularly, that 
these guys are going to be on mission with the gospel. That He did a great job preaching last week. Heard, heard some good things from that. And so, so grateful for that. But a part of chapter 10 was this picture of Peter's vision where God tells him to take, kill, and eat. And we're going to see how Peter's eyes are opened, and he's going to take that message to the party of the circumcision, those who are digging in their hills with their religious beliefs, and set them free and open up their eyes to see what Peter was seeing. Their eyes open. Verses 1 through 14. It says, The apostles and the brothers and the sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. If you could take a minute to just look at this picture here uh, of the early biblical times. In Jerusalem, that was kind of the epicenter of, of where God was doing his work and, and taking the message out from there to all kinds of different places like Antioch, and they would reach up into Tarsus to pull Saul down. Later on in this chapter, we'll see them going out for him. And, and this whole region was being gospelized. The believers had been scattered that came to know Christ after the Acts 1-8 movement, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And now the message of the gospel is being proclaimed all around the world, including to Gentiles that are now receiving the word of God. And verse 2 says, And when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. The circumcision party, holding to these values of Old Testament traditions here, they were criticizing him, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with him. Now, back in this day, according to rabbinical tradition, not the word of God, but according to rabbinical tradition, if you even brushed up against a Gentile, a non-Jew, if you associated with them, if your clothing touched, if you ate with them, surely you were considered defiled by many rabbis of that day. And so they're accusing him, saying, you went up and you ate with these people. In verse 4, Peter begins to explain step by step, Acts 11, 4 says, of what occurs. He's, and this is in reference to Acts chapter 10, the vision that Peter gets from God about the food that God has created to be seen as clean and no longer unclean in the eyes of the believer. And that this was to open up their eyes to be able to see that the gospel is now for all mankind, not just the chosen holy race of Israel. And verse 5 says, I was in the town of Joppa and I was praying and I saw in a, in a trance, and some translations will say a, a vision, and this is this picture of an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners from heaven, and it came to me. And when I looked closely at it, verse 6 says, and considered it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild beasts and the reptiles and the birds. Now, this is like a hunter's dream come true, an outdoorsman or outdoors woman. This is like a dream come true, seeing all of these animals. And verse 7 goes on to say in Acts chapter 11, I also heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. You might just put that on the back of my truck, a bumper sticker for me one day right there, because this is a great and Mighty command from God saying some of these animals that according to Old Testament law that you saw as unclean, you can eat. They are clean now. And this is discussed in, in Romans. Paul will actually even write about this, this concept of eating clean versus unclean foods. This was a difficult thing for Peter. He considered himself a, a, a devout Jew that was a follower of Jesus now. And he held true to some of these traditions, you know, thinking about circumcision and the food that you would eat and, and all this religious law that was fulfilled by Christ here on earth. Now, Peter's still wrestling with this and how he views himself. And some might even, you know, prescribe to that kind of a lifestyle today where, where they, they won't eat pork or they'll eat more of a clean Old Testament diet and and for the believer, hey, we allow them to do so. You know, it, 
You don't force that on anybody, but you allow them to do so. And, and there needs to be freedom in Christ because the scriptures are teaching us here that it's, it's opened up and it's available. It, it's kind of like this. Recently, I was talking with someone and I said, oh, I forgot to put on sunscreen. Um, I need to get in some shade. I got to put on some sunscreen. And they said to me, well, you know what sunscreen does? I go, no, what? Protects your skin from the sun? <laughs> No, it gives you cancer. Now, evidently, this person had read many articles and saw many different uh, pieces of evidence that showed that it could lead to skin cancer and cancer inside the body. You know, that there's cancers that can develop. And, and there's probably research, and rightfully so, about that. And I thought to myself, you know what else leads to cancer? The sun. <laughs> now, I chose not to get into a debate there with that person. I didn't want to get into an argument over food, what's clean and unclean, or over what causes cancer, what doesn't. Some things, we just allow the other person in our life to be able to have the freedom to do as they will, and we do as we will. But we don't hold them to that because we've been set free. This is what the Scripture is teaching us here, is that there's a fulfillment of the law, and it's found in Christ, and there's freedom now in Christ. In this freedom in Christ, it's meant for all mankind. It is meant for the Gentiles and the Jews alike. So, God tells him, take, kill, eat. In verse 8, he replies, and you know, it's the argument here of, Lord, no, surely not me, for nothing impure or ritually unclean has ever entered my mouth. And verse 9, as he recalls this vision, says, But a voice answered from heaven a second time, and it replies, What God has made clean, you must not call impure. And that's a key verse. That's pivotal here. You know, what God is offering and, and the people that he can take from unclean to the purity of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, giving them that a righteousness that's not of their own, what we would consider impure that he has made clean. Verse 10 says, Now this happened three times, and every time was drawn up again and down, uh, excuse me, up into heaven. And verse 11, At that very moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. And the Spirit told me to accompany them with no doubts at all. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we went into the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. So simultaneously, God's doing this work in their lives, and he's bringing Peter into the picture with them. And verse 14 says, He will speak a message to you by which you and your household will be saved. Peter's speaking a message to them that will open their eyes to lead them to salvation. He recounts to the circumcised believers in Jerusalem what occurred in chapter 10 real briefly here. And he includes his vision in verses 5 through 7 and his response to God in verses 8 through 10 and the trip to Cornelius' house in verses 11 through 14. And he testifies to how his eyes were opened concerning salvation for the Greeks, for the Gentiles, for those outside of the Jewish faith. And he does so with what I would consider a convincing and a strongly drawing in of these people to be able to see what God wanted them to see. Now, the next section, verses 15 through 18, I've entitled it Empowered Preaching. And verse 15 of chapter 11 makes note of this empowered preaching. It says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them, just as on us in the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There was the proselyte baptism. There was the baptism just of water. But now we're going to see people's lives transformed. 
by God. Sins forgiven, an indwelling and filling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer who's now the temple of the living God. In verse 17 it says, If then God gave them the same gift He also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? And when they heard this, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, So then, God has given us repentance, resulting in life even to the Gentiles. So we, we see now here this empowered preaching, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, convinces people to faith and draws them in. Peter was changed. His eyes were open. He was open to sharing this message with others to get them to see clearly as he had seen as well. And even Peter struggled with this concept. Peter struggled, but Peter came to that point of understanding. And I like how it's described here in Acts chapter 11, where he says, who am I to basically argue with God? If God did this same thing for us, and he's doing this work in their lives, my history, my background, my religious beliefs, my culture, my ethnicity, oh, they don't compare to the work of God. God's word and his work trump my experiences. We must elevate God's word and his work over our feelings, over our history, over our experiences. And in doing so, this opened up the gospel to a whole new group of people in Peter's eyes that it became clear to him. I can share this with anybody. And, and I might ask you, where do your eyes need to be open? Is there anyone that you're not sharing, that you're not speaking the word of God to uh, because of your religious background, upbringing, your history, your beliefs? Is there anyone that you think might be off limits? Maybe it's the, the, the drug user, abuser, the prostitute, the homeless person. Are there people in your life that you're avoiding or you're not telling, you know, family members that you just don't like and don't want to spend time with, so you don't want to waste your time on them. Are there people in your lives that you're not sharing this message with because of your history? You know, Peter, he spoke about it. It's the word speak here, and this word actually is so much deeper than just talking. I gave you some synonyms of this word here, it's listed in the fine print on your screen right there. But what we see here is it's to announce, to declare, to report, to speak forth, to not be silent, you know, to speak thoughtfully, to converse with, to utter this sound and to proclaim. And so when verse 17 says, if then God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? Well, you could hinder the work of God in your life by being silent about the work that God's done in your life. It's not meant to be silent and kept silent. It's meant to be shared. Verse 15, Peter says, as I began to speak or to declare or to converse or to proclaim about. Yes, let's not be silent in this. And in doing so, we might get to see the same results, similar results that, that Peter and others saw. Now, we're going to shift gears to kind of a, a new region, if you will, here in verses 19 and following. We're going to see an enlarged audience where God's simultaneously he's doing this work in Peter's life he's doing it in the uncircumcised party you know the party of the circumcision to 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 be able to take the message to those who are uncircumcised and he's doing it in all kinds of different places as well and, and I love that because what's shifting here is this idea of like you know hey these people don't deserve the gospel too oh my gosh tell me more about the person who just came to know Christ. Okay, verses 19 through 21, an enlarged audience. It says, Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecuted persecution that started because of Stephen 
made their way as far as these regions. So these believers who are facing persecution because of the stoning of Stephen and the fear of losing their life and persecution of being driven out, they go all the way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, up to Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. So they're kind of going on a covert secret mission. Many of them are in right to the Jews first. But we see that expanded and opened up. Verse 21 says, or excuse me, um, verse 20 says, But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Yeah, so the persecuted believers, they scatter to these regions and locations. They go right to the Jews, their own people, and they share the gospel. And some, they go and they take the message to the Greeks, like in Antioch. Now, Antioch, it was the largest city in Syria of that day. This is modern-day Turkey. It is the place that's located along the Orontes River that leads into the Mediterranean Sea. It was the capital of the Seleucid Empire at the time, and it's the origin of the Christian community because these Greeks that are present, these Hellenists, some Hellenist Jews that became Christians, uh, some who were Hellenists, just Greek-speaking people who lived a Greek lifestyle, they are coming to faith in Christ. And what we see here is the Scripture says that their hearts were turned that their lives were turned. That's the word turned, and in the Greek, in a moral sense, it's to turn upon or to to, uh, to to convert, if you will. Figuratively, this is this idea of to turn to the service and worship of the true God. And so, the expansion of the kingdom of God is, take, is of the kingdom of God is taking place. There is an enlargement of territory that's being taken ground. For the kingdom of God, we see here that many are being saved, and there's an enlarged audience. More are hearing about the mission. And what they need now is a little bit of encouragement, you know, to put a little fuel on that fire to keep it going. In verses 22 through 24, they sin none other than Barnabas, this encourager. In verse 22, it says, news about them reached in Jerusalem. So news about these believers in Antioch, these people coming to faith all over the globe now, the concept of this is is coming to them in Jerusalem. And so the church in Jerusalem, they actually sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the grace of God and he was glad and he encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. I just want you to look at that verse for me. He encouraged them to remain true in the Lord. The picture of the parable of the seeds comes to my mind. He's saying, be on that good, fertile soil. Take root. Grow in the Lord. Go deep with the Lord so that you can grow and the Lord can produce His fruit in and through you. The vine and the branches moment. He's saying, spend this time Don't just get so excited about the moment and say, well, I'm a Christian now and have no real life change occur in your life. So, no, remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. That's the name of our series as we study the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. We're calling it devoted. Remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. And so this is what Barnabas encourages them to do. And verse 20 says, 4 says, He was a good man, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a large number of people were added to the Lord. Yes, this is Barnabas the Apostle. the apostle, Barnabas the Encourager. The son of encouragement, his name means. He was given that nickname that Joseph gave him, a prominent member of that early church, right? And so 
We need encouragement for the mission. When you see somebody sharing their faith, when you see somebody discipling, or when you see somebody equipping others for the faith, when you see someone remaining in the Lord, like we need to encourage that. We need to foster that. We need to celebrate it. It's been so cool watching baptism after baptism at Anchor, and we've got more to come this summer. And, and we need to celebrate those moments and encourage others to be steadfast and remain in the Lord, because we represent Christ. You know, yeah, sure, we represent ourselves, our family, our our community, our our, our church, our our nation, but more importantly, we represent Christ. And and He gives us a, a, a new nature. He gives us a new home in heaven and not hell. He gives us a new family in the family of God. He gives us a new name. And it's the name Christian. We're going to see that here in verses 25 through 26. An enduring name. The Bible's going to talk about a lot of different names for a follower of Jesus. But they're first called Christians right here in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Verses 25 through 26 says this. Then, okay, Barnabas and Saul, they're going to make that connection. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him down to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met there with the church and taught large numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. This name that has endured for centuries, for thousands of years, this name given to the title of those who follow Jesus, Barnabas and Paul spent time And at this time, his name is still Saul. They spend time investing, equipping, discipling, mentoring, building up the church. And that does take time. Anchor Church, in Chama, those watching online around the globe, the growth of the church, it takes time. It takes investment. It takes everyone to be a part of it. It's not just association by name. It goes further than that. It goes beyond that. And and we need to be taught what it means to be a Christian. This word Christian here, it's the name that was given to disciples here, those who followed Christ, and it was first adopted here at Antioch. It's a word that can mean learner at times, one who's faithful, a brother, a saint, But this word right here, it was meant to describe those who looked like Christ. Christian, a little Christ, or Christ-like. Now, in seeking a a new term, Kent Hughes writes it this way, seeking a new term to describe what they were seeing, they took the Greek name for Messiah, Christ, and they added a Latin suffix to it producing this hybrid of the word that we know in English as Christian. Now, this Greek term was important because it was describing the Messiah in this way. Jews, they probably would refrain from using it. It would be seen to them as, I can't call those people Messiah followers because that would be expressing that, oh yeah, okay, he really was the Messiah. And and many of those Jews had not converted, and they did not believe that. And so in Acts 19, um, we see Christians called the way, or those who are part of the way. Many times, they were just referred to as as Gentiles. But this word Christian has a lot of meaning to be Christ-like, to be a follower of Jesus, to to believe in the one who was the Messiah. In, In the Bible, we see followers, children, believers, beloved, disciples, saints. Like we see these terms that are used to describe Christians and what Christians are called. And, and that name is something that we need to be proud of. I, I'm proud of my name as Jared Bridge of the Bridge family. Yeah, I'm proud to represent my home that way and proud to have uh, nephews that are at least going to carry on my name for me if my girls all get married and take on other names. But I'm proud to be a part of the Bridge family, but there's a family that I belong to that I'm even more proud to be a part of. I'm more humbled to be a part of. I'm I'm grateful to be a part of, and that's the family of God and the name Christian. 
I'm grateful to be called a Christian. It's not something I want to avoid. It's something I lean into. All of the good that it offers and all of the difficulty that it offers. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 says, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. We need to understand what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower, to be the beloved of God, to be a family member in the kingdom of God. And we need to realize that we'll face persecution because of it. People will spit at us and name call us, and they will take the opportunity to put us down and push us down so that they can have what they would consider their power or their way. And we should not be ashamed to be associated with that name Christian, even when we face difficulty and even when we face persecution. In fact, it's in those moments that we renew the vision for our lives, that we renew the passion for our lives, that we see the confirmation of our lives on us, that we truly are followers of Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, they persecuted me. They're going to put me to death. They put Jesus to death. You know, they're going to do the same to you, those who follow me. And when they hate you, they're not really hating you. They're hating me in you because I stand for truth. I stand for what is good. I stand for light. And that's in opposition to the darkness and falseness and evil. They are in opposition. They don't work. They go against each other. But light exposes darkness. Good overcomes evil. Truth triumphs over false all day long and for all of eternity. And so when a believer is called a Christian, it's such a powerful term. Really two that I want to center in on that can lead us today with this understanding that the gospel's for all mankind and it transforms Jew and Gentile alike, but it invites them into this role. It's the role of a servant of Christ and a follower of Jesus. Evaluate in your own life. Do you consider yourself a bondservant of Jesus, a servant of Christ, a slave to Christ, one indebted to Christ, one who serves Jesus, one who gives Christ their life, one who says, all that I am, all that I hope to be, it's yours? Do you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, one who says, I will follow the Lord, not the way of the world. I will stand for truth and I will follow the word of God, not the whims of the world. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul declared himself that. He said, I, Paul, a servant, or in some translations, a bondservant. And even in others, it says a slave of Christ, called an apostle and set apart. I've been, I've been picked and set apart, and I've yielded my life to that. I've surrendered to this idea. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. All that I am, all that I hope to be is his. And in Matthew Chapter 16, verse 24, what we see here take place is Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, he's got to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah, what does it mean to follow Jesus? You deny yourself. You deny the way of the world. Because remember, friends, yes, you represent yourself. You represent your family, your community, your church, your country. But more importantly, you represent Christ Jesus. A Christian that represents Christ is a person who serves the agenda of Christ, the mission of Christ, who serves Christ as their Lord. A person with the name Christian is one who follows Jesus. We don't follow TikTok or YouTube. We don't follow our professors. We don't follow the world. We don't follow the music of the day and age or the movies or the media. We follow Jesus. It's the Word of God that informs our lives on how we should live. And that's our standard. That trumps our feelings. That trumps our history. That trumps our experiences. Heavenly Father, today... 
we want to look at this sermon and we want to ask ourselves this question. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? How does that play out day in and day out? The name Christian, what does that really mean? And do I embody it? Do I represent it? Am I truly a servant of Christ, a follower of Jesus? Maybe today's a message where there's a renewed vision in, my, in our lives as we listen and we read the Word of God, where we say, yes, Lord. My answer is yes on the table. What's your question for me? Oh, yeah, it's just yes. That's the answer. I'm always going to be a yes for you. I want to do what you want for me, Lord. And today, we need to look. At, are there any biases in our life? Is there anything from our history or our past or our prism in which we view the world that's keeping us from sharing this message with others? Any preconceived notions that we have? Any fears that we have? or even any religious or ethnic barriers that we have concerning who the gospel is meant for. God, I pray that we'd yield ourselves to your plan. And just like you opened Peter's eyes, you might open our eyes as well. And that we could share this message with the world around us and that many would be saved. We could go from eyes opened wide to an enlarged, audience to seeing many saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today as we studied Acts 11 together. God bless you, and let's finish our time worshiping Jesus. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all 